Hi, everybody. Um, I like to not stand at the podium. Can you all hear me okay? Yes? Okay. In the back, though, really. Can you hear me okay? All right. All right. You can give me the wobbly head if not. You'll be like, I can't hear you. All right. So, very excited to be here. I've been thinking about giving this talk for years. And, you know, usually, I don't know if you, you submit talks. When you submit talks, yeah. If you don't speak into the mic, Oh, they can't record. Ah, okay. Here I am at the podium. So boring. We're at every other conference now. Um, so I've been thinking about giving this talk for years because uh, <laughs> I, I've had some really tough times. I've learned some hard lessons. And I felt like if I kept those to myself, other people are learning those hard lessons on their own. I don't say that with, you know, great pride. I say it with a lot of humility. Let me try and save people some pain. Every time I experience one of those, I think, yep, this is gonna go in the talk. So you are getting the first unvarnished version of this talk, which is as much about the title of the talk, how to succeed in a role that didn't exist, as it is me trying to distill some hard earned lessons from mostly failures. <laughs> this is a talk mostly about distillation of failures. And it is really about resilience. B-Sides is the place I wanted to do it. Because this conference is about community, is about learning from each other, and in effect, is very much about this kind of resilience, this kind of storytelling. So the first thing is, who am I? Um, when I think about who I am, it's such a, like an existential question. Who are you? What do you do? What have you done? Why are you here? Those are all like big existential questions, but I'm gonna try and answer those for you. I'm gonna answer them in reverse order because I don't know why I'm here really or who I am, but I'll tell you what I've done. I've worked in a lot of different domains of trying to help people and organizations understand uncertainty. That's what I've done. I've done a lot of different domains, terrorism, fraud, geopolitics, cyber investigations, critical infrastructure, supply chain. I don't say that with braggadocio. I say that like it spans a variety. I've worked in nuclear policy, a lot of different areas, which means I've been new a lot, new to an industry, new to a field, unproven. I'm here because as I said before, I really wanna share these hard earned lessons with you in a way that I hope is very actionable for you either today or someday soon. So who am I? I'm one of you. I'm someone who is focused on community, uh, which is, I assume why you all are here too. I'm someone who cares about people. I'm a relational person. Thank you. And I'm someone who has only succeeded because other people have helped me. All those domains I talked about, I'm not experts in those domains. And I entered into them not as experts. The only reason I was able to do those jobs, the only reason I was able to do a role that didn't exist before is because of the community of people around me that I kind of joke, but not really. I'm not smart. I know smart people. Yep. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Okay. All right. Yes, maybe, no, okay, no worries. Yes, haha, -ha. all right. So here's what we're gonna cover. What does it mean to have a new role? I wanna define that very clearly and how do you identify it? If you're interviewing for it or you might be in one and not even recognize that it's a new role. Second, what are the likely pitfalls? How do you manage those? That's where I wanna spend the bulk of the time. And then what you must do early and how to learn quickly. The end of this is, unless you want to go through a very painful experience, like I have multiple times, that's the dot, dot, dot that follows this. So that is, those are some core things. And I'm not gonna hide this. I'm not one of those people that puts all the beautiful stuff and wonderful stuff at the end. Like all this is gonna be pretty much up front. So let's talk about what it means to have a new role. Um, this is, pretty, I think, I mean, it's always true in technology 
and perhaps in cyber that there's something new. But does it not feel like we're on the cusp of another new moment where there's going to be a bunch of newly minted AI experts? Right? There's going to be a bunch of new roles. I don't see that being glib. How many of you have seen those postings? How many of you have been tempted to apply for those roles? Yeah, we were like, yeah, man, I'm an AI security person. You bet. So the first is, you know, what does it mean to have a new role and how to identify it? So I think the big, uh, are you getting the move ahead? No, okay, just on mine. All right, here we go. This is my favorite photo. Uh, so lots of times, you know, it's like, I think about this phrase, unicorn. Unicorn, something that puts it all together. HR and recruiter, pe recruiter folks will sometimes call it the purple squirrel. Have you ever heard that term before? This is a, a term that HR and recruiter folks use to describe, you know, all those bullets. They know that they can't find somebody that has all those bullets. They're not designing for that person. They're designing for someone approximate that that's a purple squirrel unicorn. So this to me is like, oh no, I, I understand machine learning and models. Boom, I'm an AI person now. And I think this isn't, totally inaccurate, but there is sometimes a moment where that didn't exist before. So how do you genuinely figure out if it didn't exist before versus it's just an evolution of something? There's three things I think about. First, where is that organization in its maturity? That doesn't mean the organization itself has to be mature. That means where is the organization in its maturity? So. It could be a Fortune 500 company, but is finally at the place where it's recognizing the need for something. It very often people think new roles are at new companies. I don't think that's necessarily true. At a, at a startup, I've worked at multiple startups. At a startup, there's a tendency to be like, every role is new, no one's ever had this before. Yeah, well, at that company, sure, because it's a new company. But does anyone have this? So the second thing is to figure out what is it at the intersection of? almost always guaranteed it's an intersection of at least two, sometimes three things. And the third, I'll get to this a little bit more, is you are going to ask the question, need to ask the question and seek the answer. Why didn't this exist before? Why is it being created now? What prompted that? There's a lot of questions underneath that, but that question over and over and over. So the, the other title of this talk, but I wasn't sure that it would make it through the review board because it was oh, a little too goofy was becoming a pirate unicorn because that's how I think about new roles. Uh, a pirate unicorn supposes that there's a world of unicorns. There are so many unicorns that there can actually be a pirate unicorn. <laughs> Thank you. Here are all the images of pirate unicorn that I love. Uh, the middle one I think might be my favorite, but I also like the be who you are. Uh, so the, the idea behind the pirate unicorn, which is what I've kind of coined this new role, like truly new role, is it's fun, it's exciting, it's also a threat. Some people will see it the same way they viewed pirates, not cool, but like they're here to steal your shit. And they're gonna use guerrilla tactics to do it. Uh, and they shouldn't trust you because you're gonna take something from them. And so I like the idea of putting these two images together. Also at the very end, there's time I'll tell you another kind of funny, not really funny, not ha ha funny, but like what string funny, a story about pirate unicorn. All right, so I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but let's talk briefly what are the pros and cons of the pirate unicorn? I would like this to be a bit interactive if we can, even though I'm up here talking at you. So I want you to take a minute, 30 seconds. Just think of one thing that you think is great about being the pirate unicorn and one thing that sucks about being the pirate unicorn. So just raise your hand. I'm going to call on you, yell it out, and I'll repeat. Yes. You don't know what you don't know. Is that a pro or a con? 
Someone said yes. I agree, yes. You don't know what you don't know. Okay, yes. You're special. You're special and you're the only one. Pro or con? Great. Special is pro. You're the only one. Con, there's no one to learn from. I'll put a caveat on that. There's no one to learn from. There's no one to learn from at your organization, which is why this matters. This matters because there's other pirate unicorns out there. All right. Any others? Yeah. Yes, okay, so there's wide open space in front of you, but you don't really know where the boundaries are. I will caveat a little bit or add a little bit and say it, it looks wide open to you. But it's claimed by everybody else. You're like, look at all this open space. And everyone's like, who's that king running through our yard? You're like, it's me, the pirate unicorn, galloping beautifully. Okay, one more. Yes. Okay, this person could give this talk. Um, they said, you, the pro is you can lead the way, con is you have to explain to everyone why you're there. So that's my talk, basically. <laughs> there it is, yay, thank you. All right, enjoy the rest of you. Um, so here that, thank you. Yeah, it was brief to the point. Okay, so here's sort of distilled. What's awesome, what's terrible, so what's awesome? You're innovative by your very existence. Oh my gosh, you're new? How innovative. Like this wasn't here before. So anything you do is innovative by virtue of the fact that it has not been done before. I say that a little bit glib. Okay, very glib, but you get my point. You're ready to partner with everybody. Everybody's maybe ready to partner with you, question mark, but you're like, yes, totally I'll work with you. Absolutely, I'd love to come learn about your team. I'd love to tell you what I do as soon as I figure it out. Like you're just, none of those boundaries are really there. It's impossible to fail. No one knows what failure looks like. No one knows what success looks like. So what's terrible? You know nothing and no one cares. I'm being very, this comes from a, a darker place, just maybe like two days ago. But the point is that you, you don't know what you don't know. And even including sometimes your boss, no one really is set up to be like, I'm gonna help you succeed because it's gonna help me succeed. Like you're lucky if you come in with that. But most times people are like, eh, okay. No one knows who needs you and why. This is really important. This is really crucial. I'll come back to this later. But one of your most important tasks is to figure out who are your internal customers. That's a very corporate way of saying who needs you and who do you need? I would argue that in the first 90 days, you should have a very clear map of that. You develop hypotheses, you test them. You talk to people, you roll out different products, ideas, you float things, you see, ah yes, that person needed it. Oh no, that person, it didn't change anything. That person is saying things that I know that I'm gonna do without me having asked them, prompted them, they need, and why? So. The good thing here is that I would argue that the second bullet is really crucial for security and risk folks generally. You should generally be doing this. But in this role, you have to. Otherwise, you're just gonna float. You're not gonna fail, it's gonna be worse. You're gonna float. And it's impossible to succeed because no one has done it before. So, glass half full, half empty, some people are gonna be like, sky's the limit, try anything. And other people are gonna be like, yeah, no one succeeded in that before. Uh, can you remind me this talk is being recorded, yes? Okay. So uh, <laughs> I wanna share some stories, but I need to sanitize them appropriately. I worked at a large organization. And at that large organization, um, it had been around for a couple hundred years. And the group that I was in had been around for this many. It was this many years old when I showed up. And my organization 
within that larger structure was already the pirate unicorn. And I was, I don't know, the pirate unicorn on the pirate unicorn, I don't know, the metaphor breaks down. It, it was really challenging to come in because that was new. I was doing cyber risk and cyber defense for a city government. This was at a time when people were like, huh? Like why municipal cybersecurity? How would you, how would you be doing that? Like, are we paying for that? Are taxes paying for that? Like, shouldn't we be spending more on the fire department or whatever else? So there's a lot more in the what's awesome and what's terrible. And I don't mean to be, I do mean to be, why am I even saying that? I do mean to be a little glib about the what's awesome because it's gonna be shiny and it's gonna draw you to it. So here I'm trying to, pun intended, ground you on the things that you might not realize later. Okay, next piece is in nature, generally speaking, there are some exceptions. I am not a biologist, but I did read about this a little bit out of curiosity and then in preparation for this talk about how environments in nature respond to a new species. And there's three general ways. First, this is some kind of threat, predatory. Second is not predatory, but displacement. And the third is additive. In my totally non-scientific review of like, you know, some of the research around this, I didn't read papers, I read like case studies, things that I could access with a little bit of generative AI to help. A majority were the first two. Predatory threat or displacement. Read invasive, spe invasive species. So maybe they didn't, you know, uh, take away something on the food chain, but they displaced a bunch of space or something else. So most environments view new as threats. Like we kind of valorize the pirate. But if you're a shipping person, like piracy is a huge, huge problem for you. They're taking away your hard earned goods and currency, right? There's nothing sexy about it. And so I say that with the calibration that you might be brought into a new role, wait for it, right after that company has done layoffs right when someone was told, we don't have a budget for that. Right after the initiative that they've been trying to put forward as a new evolutionary initiative, not even revolutionary, new evolutionary initiatives, they were told, yeah, we just, we don't have the support, the real appetite to do something new right now. And then the pirate unicorn shows up without knowing or needing to know anything about you or caring about you. That person you can understand from a place of empathy is gonna view you either as a threat or as an invasive species. So personally, the way I've dealt with this is two ways. The first, I call it out. And I will talk to you in a little bit about how to get the information so that you can put it forward in a way that is acceptable. Because I also tell you from a place of learning that I've tried to be self-effacing and people are like, look at this dude, thinking he's like the best and thinking that he knows our organization, he just showed up. So I'll give you kind of that more. But the second way, always, always, always with humor. Always, always, always for me with humor. So. I make light of the fact that my title is new and didn't exist or is really long or what is it before uh, that no one did this before. And I used to make jokes about AI. Now I can't because it's actually happening. Um, I would make jokes that I was like half a robot. I was like a prototype. Like I would just stupid stuff, but to let people know that I knew that I was new, pun intended. Um, 
at one of the organizations I was at, not only, so here's the, the question that you need to keep in mind when you're having conversations, meeting people. We didn't need you before, why do we need you now? We didn't need you before, why do we need you now? By the way, that loaded statement is not limited to roles. I'm gonna digress a little bit here. Most recently I've worked in software supply chain security. Software supply chain security. We didn't need that before, why do we need it now? Don't we just like secure what developers do? Right, like you can take almost anything, zero trust, like what? AI security, we didn't need it before, like what? But you could take any relatively new thing that's been there in cybersecurity. And then you're kind of caught on the back foot because you're explaining what is the consequence of not having it, which is very difficult place to be counterfactual. So I'm queuing something up here, which is like, all right, Manish, well, what do we say? Come back around to that. But the most important orienting thing, even if you get introduced with a bunch of fanfare and a press release, and I have gotten the introduction from the CEO to the executive team, check out this new role, ta-da. There still is, most of the time, it's gonna be one of those two, predatory, invasive. And it's unconscious. And oh, by the way, it does not help if you're an underrepresented group. There have been zero out of five times that I've done this where people are like, cool, a person of color in this role. To go back to the pirate unicorn, like if we somehow figured out that the pirate unicorn was gay, someone would be like, oh man, the gays are everywhere. You know, like it's like that comes in unconsciously that I got the role because I'm underrepresented, because I'm different. Or, and I've had people intimate this, like be explicit about it. Oh, they had to create a role for you. And I always respond one way. Yeah, the other ones weren't hard enough. That's why they had to create a new one. Remember I said at the beginning, it's gonna be the nexus of two, maybe three things. So now let's talk about really a new role. Why are new roles created? Who creates them? This is crucial. I would argue again that security and RISPO should be doing this thinking about their organization dynamics, politics, and organizational capital. So why are new roles created? A couple different reasons. Lots of times, somebody's like, yeah, let's bring that person in. They're creating an around person, which you would think is pretty cool. And it is, it can be. But the challenge is the scaffolding is built around that individual. Ergo, when they step away, it sort of collapses around them. Or people don't see the architectural design, they just see it as like built around the profile of who that is. So who creates them? This is important. I'm gonna jump around a little bit. These questions aren't totally linear. So what prompted it? Why now? Who sponsored? Has the organization done this before? There's a few slides in here. I think there's gonna be put a few slides in here that if you either have this role or you think you might be looking at this role, this is one of them. Take this. These questions are ones that you need to figure out. If you want to go into that role, eyes wide open. If you wanna jump in, figure it out as you, you go, cool. Good luck, Pirate Unicorn. But if you try and search some of the answers to these, and this can happen in interviews, it can happen in uh, talking with people who have left the organization, talking to people at similar organizations. So the one question I ask in an interview, it's kind of like a two-part question, and this is early on, when I get like the screening call opportunity or that's the official pathway, unofficial pathway, someone's like, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Do you wanna, like, we're, I think you might be right for this. I ask two questions joined together. It's that middle one. What prompted this and why now? So that reveals a lot. It tells you how much they've thought about it. It tells you what are the pain points that are coming in in advance and why now? What is this moment? What has happened? Because guaranteed, how many of you tried to hire someone before? Tried to get headcount, right? Try and get headcount to hire someone. You gotta line everything up, right? And it's like, now. No, it didn't work. Now, no, now. And so at large organizations, this is the last one, who sponsored it? 
someone, likely multiple people, have spent organizational and political capital to get that role. To get that role created, to create space for it, to justify it, if there's a job description, to put it out there, all of that. Figuring out who that is and why they did it is critical to your early success. First, go find them and introduce yourself. I know that sounds silly because you're like, of course I'm gonna know them, of course I'm gonna know that you're there. Nope, hard lesson I learned here. I assumed that everybody that I had interacted with had already had the introduction as to why I'm here or that senior person had desi designed or decided this. So in the next role that I did that in, I, again, with humility, it's one of the key things I'm gonna say, humility and humor are gonna get you a long way as a pirate unicorn. So with humility, I went to people and said, oh, so I, I was talking to you and I understood this is why. They need, and sometimes they just say it. They needed to build a threat intelligence capability that had this function. In. And that's the experience that I have. In one role, um, it was, I didn't have as much cyber experience as I knew that, as I assumed that they would need in that particular domain. I was upfront with that all the way across. I was like, I have not done 10 years of cloud security implementation or like managed hundreds of thousands of endpoints. I've not done that. And this is one of those times that it reinforced, I'm saying this to you with humility, that being very open about my experience was crucial because they're like, good, yeah, we're not looking for that. I said, okay, well, here's how I would approach this role. I'm veering a little bit here into the interview process, but it comes back around to this because that's how I learned how the role came to be. I said, here's how I'd approach this role. That was, that was basically the interview. How would you do this? Well, I think about it this way and I think I would do this first. Um, these are the frameworks that I would be drawing from. These are the disciplines that I'm coming from. And then, okay, fast forward, got the job, yay. I learned that the person who had really pushed for that role was not in these conversations, not in the interview process, and had a completely different reason, very valid one, completely different reason for advocating for this. So going to them, when I found out who it was and I went to them, I was gonna be like, I'm here, like the person you were thinking of, it's me, thank you so much. And they were like, you were not what I was expecting. That's what they said. Uh, the pause was a little longer. Um, and I said, oh, t tell me more. <laughs> well, I'm here now, like, tell me why. And I basically got the story of why they pushed for the creation of this role. And it was very different than what I was told and sold. So a little bit of a orange flag went off, not yellow flag, not red flag, orange flag, like under construction. And I got to explore that a little bit and then more informed as I went there. So. What prompted it? Why now? Who sponsored it? Has the organization done this before? That's the other thing. Does the organization do this a lot? Do they create roles a lot? Do they create new roles? Are they sp spawning pirate unicorns all the time? That's not a good thing or a bad thing, but it is a telling thing. If they do it a lot, they better be good at it helping you succeed, helping you figure out who to talk to, giving you some sort of here's what's new, here's what's not. Okay, our uh, vaunted audience member over here talked about something, needing to explain what you do. Here is a tenant I try and basically live by. Tell your story or someone else will. Why are you here? Remember, invasive species, that's the default. You need to show and explain and demonstrate probably repeatedly that you are there as an additive part of the ecosystem. You're gonna help the ecosystem flourish by your existence, not threaten it. And so telling your story is not actually your story. And the other thing I should put in here, but it was too many words I thought for this, have other people tell your story. 
So hopefully you know some people coming to that organization. But if not, find some quick allies and give them a story that they can tell. It's most impactful, not when you tell it, but when someone tells it, when you're not in the room, you're not gonna be in a lot of rooms in the beginning. Oh, who's that? That's the new director of X and X. That's a new role to do innovation in this. They're gonna do this. This person hired them. Just the real quick and easy. Because what are people trying to do? What are you trying to do when someone new comes in? Where do you fit in? What are you? Whose team are you on? Are you gonna help me? Should I be working with you? Are you gonna be working for me? Are we gonna be competing for the same things? Those are all the questions people are tilting around in their head. So if you give them a quick like, you are here, dot, that's very helpful. Two other things about telling your story. Again, hard lessons. It's very, very difficult to explain from a security perspective why the absence of something is a problem or an intelligence perspective. I've worked in organizations and one organization I was there to help thread together strands in geopolitical risk, terrorism, fraud, cyber investigations. And this organization had whole teams dedicated to fraud and whole teams dedicated to investigations of which there were cyber investigations. And terrorism was everywhere in the headlines, the board was talking about it, executives were concerned about it, and geopolitical risk is very hard for people to get their heads around. But people were making decisions based on all of those things. So when I say tell a story, I don't mean make some shit up. I mean figure out what you're there to do. So in that case, adversaries, our adversaries, were exploiting each of those seams and this organization was dealing with them as they came in. And in dealing with those silos, there were seams. My team's job was to close those, find the blind spots, because the way you look at, analyze, mitigate fraud, very different than the way you think about cybercrime investigations, a large financial institution. They shouldn't be. All of you are like, what? Yep, but they are. And terrorism, people didn't really care about fraud. It's not particularly sexy. But terrorism, was like, oh my goodness. Okay, what? Yes, what do we need to do? And we had to connect those two because the adversaries definitely were. They're using credit card fraud to fund this. It was really fast. And guess where they were doing it? On the dark web, cybercrime. Like, there was the there was the arc. And it felt very clear. But being able to tell that, people were like, oh, okay, got it. And it, it's not like that popped up immediately. I took time to earn towards that. So I'm gonna talk about two or three other things, and then I really wanna get some questions and conversation going here. In another one of my roles, I knew that it didn't exist before, and I knew that I was gonna be met with resistance. This is another tenant. Everybody can and will tell you what wrong looks like, but nobody can tell you what right looks like. Everybody's gonna be like, that doesn't work. Try that. That's not gonna work. We've tried that before, that doesn't work here. And so then your natural thing would be like, oh cool, what does work? Then they're like, I don't know. Isn't that why you're here, pirate unicorn? So it took me the fifth time to figure out how to deal with this. Because I dealt with this like defensively, I tried to persuade people. Um, I tried to convince them early on, but look at my plan. Look at this beautiful PowerPoint I've built. How about I come in and tell you about what this thing is? I started an organization. I was working on critical infrastructure. Most people in the organization did not know what critical infrastructure was. It was like, well, I'm gonna go on a like, tour. I'll, I'll come in and talk to you about critical infrastructure. Da -da -da -da. Here's critical infrastructure. And they were like, that seems like a waste of time. <laughs> like, I don't know what it is. Why is it important? So my sincere advice 
is when you find yourself in a place where you think you're going to hear or you start to hear, nope, that's not gonna work, can't do that, we've tried that before, get aggressively curious. Ask people, okay, tell me why. What have you tried? When did you try it? And how did that work? What did you learn? Push them. Two things are gonna happen. One, a lot of people aren't gonna actually have things that they tried, it's just a feeling, a perception. And now you get to press that. Two, you're gonna find some people. You know this, most of the people who are the doers, they're not the ones who are naysayers. They're like, yeah, I tried that, it didn't work. So eventually I find the like doer who actually tried the thing. Oh yeah, we couldn't do it because uh, this thing, this sort of budgetary thing was there. This thing, we had this technical hang up. Oh, well, is that still here? Because we moved this. I don't know, I moved on to other projects. Wait a minute, what? It might actually work? So, you can build on other people's, I won't even say failures, previous tries. That's how I found success. And I did, y'all, I did, I found success. And I was always very open that it was like, oh no, I didn't come up with all this. This was built on what that person did five years ago before this whole thing was even conceived of. This was built on this. They tried this two quarters ago, but the budget wasn't there or I wasn't here. Or we just had that incident. Now we know how that's actually gonna go. So when everyone tells you what wrong looks like and no one can tell you what right looks like, get aggressively curious, ask them, what did you try? How did you try it? What did you learn? Figure out what assumptions they made. See if you can take on those assumptions or test them again. Like seriously, get scientific. And then you can figure out if their experience, their anecdotes, their insight, their case studies, their proof of concept can be used again. There's a really good chance that it can. There's a really good chance that it can. So last couple things before I close with, you know, hopefully giving you something to really, really sink into. So find the sponsor, identify recruitables. I think I talked about the sponsor before who brought it in. In multi-party negotiation, um, you will hear the term in business, stakeholder, stakeholder management. Stakeholder is really generic. It's lots of different kinds of stakeholders. So when you're designing and taught multi-party negotiation, that strategy, you map out the players you put them in three categories, allies, adversaries, recruitables. It's funny, because in cyber, we just think adversaries. We don't often think about allies. Think about our team, maybe. Not like allies. Allies, adversaries, recruitables. So adversaries, I don't need to tell you who those are, how to identify them. Allies, I'm not gonna spend time on them, because I think you probably have a sense recruitables. So in one of my roles, I did my best in all the early listening. You got to know this team, this team, this team. Who did people whine about on my team? And who did I think whined about our team or didn't like our team? And who did we need? That intersection are the recruitables. Who can you bring over? So this is delicate. That's why it's later here. I would argue if you aren't like a seasoned navigator of organizational politics, this is a good time to lean on your mentors and advisors. But in that new role, you're gonna need to learn how to do this. And the this is to go talk to the recruitables and potentially recruit them. There is one organization I was at, I came up with the stakeholder map and without labeling them recruitables, I just put a question mark and that column, I showed it to my boss. And like that whole column, he had the same reaction. He was like, they don't like us. It's like, hmm, do you think they talk to me? I don't know, you're new. Cool, are you okay if I go talk to them? Can't hurt. So I did. And you know what I said? Hey, I'm new here. It's the best opener. You ever moved to a new town? New city, new place, come to a new conference. 
How many of you is first time at B-Sides? Cool. Oh my gosh, amazing. Welcome. You're sitting, standing next to somebody? Easy. It's my first conference. Have you been here before? What are they gonna say? Yes. Cool. Me too. No. Great. What should I know? I did the same thing. I'm new here. Surprise, surprise. Sometimes people would be like, me too. Oh, good. So you don't have the world organizational shit and neither do I. And if they weren't, I would say, tell me what I should know about my team. Most people were surprised by that. They thought I was coming over to like prove something. I'm part of the new team. And the new role too. I said, no, I have a new role. Remember I told you I was very open about it. New role, just created. And on that team, what should I know about it? What's the history between our teams? Woo. Now it's your turn. Can you be candid? Because if you, person who I'm talking to, don't take this opportunity to try and repair and mend these relationships, that is now on you. So the you don't know what you don't know, I put that back on them. I don't know what I should know. Help me understand. It's us against the adversaries. So what should I know? So this goes back to the customers and stakeholders. Who's going to gain from this new role? You might be surprised. It's not going to be people necessarily in the immediate orbit. For example, there was one role I came in and I was going to be speaking to the media and industry and you know, whatever else. And no one had linked me up with the marketing people, but I went to the marketing people. They're like, what? You're here? Great. Awesome. Can we talk to you? Can you help us? And I was like, yes, help me understand this. And, but no one had thought to make that link. No indictment of the organization, but it just, no one knew really what this role is going to be. So they didn't know who was going to gain from it. And then occasionally, and it's a really wonderful thing, you will find people who have been waiting for you. And sometimes you might be that person and a new role comes in and you'll be like, oh, we've been waiting for you. Here's a stack of work. And also, can you help with this? And oh, you have that skill set? Oh, great. We've been waiting for you. And then the last one. Ask this question and listen with empathy. Because if you listen with your hackles raised, then you will become an invasive species. Who wants and needs you to fail? Who needs you to fail in this new role? It does not mean they're going to try and get you to fail. But understanding that, that's a potential recruitable. And as well, it will tell you a ton about organizational dynamics. Maybe that person used to be a pirate unicorn. And they got, this has happened. I don't know why I'm saying maybe. I sensed some part of the environment just like focus on me, kind of like this. I was like, hey, hey, <laughs> like that's how I felt like I was greeted all the time. Or when people would say their name, be like this person, who oh, shit. And I learned, again, aggressive curiosity, empathy, humility, that that person used to be a pirate unicorn and it didn't work. So they got put into this box, man. So they didn't want me to succeed because if I succeeded, then what did that mean about them? Not about the organization and the existence of pirate unicorns. Man, what a humbling moment that was when I had that realization and it was months and I say months because maybe months isn't a long time, but in this case, it was a long time before I could talk to them about it because it was disclosed to me, not in the best way. Finally had the opportunity. And then that person became such a huge supporter. Guess who opened up their book of lessons and anecdotes and proof of concepts and relationships. And it became like a great teammate. So I asked that question not to say, spot the snipers who wants and needs you to fail. But it will tell you a lot about organizational dynamics that had nothing to do with that individual and everything to do about the environment that we were in. Okay, so last thing, I've heaped a bunch of things on you. 
some questions. Thanks, Manish. Kind of helpful. I give you some very tactical advice. And I have given this to many, many people. I take it myself. One of the most crucial things in the new rule is figuring out what success is going to look like. Some organizations are terrible at defining success. I don't mean just having KPIs. I mean measuring progress. And again, if it hasn't been done before, how do we figure that out? So here's the good news. There's a lot of pirate unicorns out there. Awesome if you're just walking this talk and hearing about pirate unicorns, come on in. There's a lot of pirate unicorns out there and you don't have to reinvent that. So there's a book that I recommend to just about everybody. I read it myself when I start a new job. It's called The First 90 Days. And the focus of this is there's different models of what kind of role you're coming into. Startup, a turnaround, accelerator, realignment, sustaining success. It's about diagnosing what you're coming into and building a learning agenda for your first 90 days. Now this book, one caveat, don't read it cover to cover. It's a guidebook, it's a choose your own adventure. Sometimes you're gonna come up, it's gonna be one kind of thing, you're gonna focus on that. Now that I have reread re -read this book every time I start a new role. And if you're a mentor, by the way, and you have protégés, this is a great gift. When they get that job, here, read this book. A lot of the things I've talked about are captured in here. Not everything, because it's not all the nuance of the new role, the stuff I was sharing with you, but a lot of it is captured in here. Otherwise, I would have had to come up with this whole rubric, but a lot of what I figured out and how to put together when I found this book, I was like, oh yes, I tried that, but that's way better. Oh, I did that, but that's backed by research. Oh, I did that, but here's a proven example in business, not just security. So I realize I am right up on time. I didn't leave room for any questions. All right, we have a few minutes, right, for questions? Two, three? Great. Sorry, I meant to leave so much more time. Thank you. Pirate unicorns. Okay, cool. If you have questions, put your hands up. I'm gonna take a few at a time. Maybe we can put them together. Yes, question. Say that again. Got it. What if you're not new to the role and trying to restart things? Other question? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so you're hiring a pirate unicorn. All right, so restart and then hiring a pirate unicorn. One other question, yeah. Like a new initiative, kind of? Yeah, I'm going to repeat back the question. That's what I'm doing. Say it again. Yes. Got it. Okay. Got it. Okay. So trying to create, trying to create space for a pirate unicorn. You've hired a pirate unicorn. Now, how do you have them succeed? And you're trying to restart something that's not necessarily a new role. I would say. Okay. I would say treat it like a new role. You're going to find some people who are there, but that same skepticism is going to be there. I mean, tilt heavier on the see you as an invasive species and a predator. That's what I would say. But all the things I put up there in terms of or talked about in terms of like curiosity and humility, I think are really important. Um, I would share the knowledge that you have that this is not new. I understood that someone has tried to do this before. What do you think are some of the key lessons that they learned or they should have learned? Or what do you wish they did earlier? You know, like come to the organization, come to people with that. In terms of yourself, try and get all the materials, anything. What list were they on? Whose team were they on? What function did they report to? Because as much as you can understand about that previous role, you can then calibrate the lessons that you get from that. That makes sense. Um, these two, so how do you set up someone for success when you come in and how do you, what are the next steps if you identify that there's a nexus of those needs? So these two are connected. Figure out what the story is. Timing. 
timing, timing, timing is key. Figure out what the story is and find people who are gonna be there advocating for that person when they come in. So it's the sponsor, 100%. Someone's gonna need to put down, we're in Vegas, someone's gotta bankroll you. Someone's gotta put down that political capital and that organizational capital. But then you need a bunch of people around who are gonna advocate for them, get them into rooms, be prepared to partner with them. And be ready to, to hear the, the kind of story so that when they come in, they don't have to do a lot of that communication. Oh yeah, I heard about your role. You're gonna be doing this? You're on this team? So it sounds weird, but minimize as much of the newness as possible. Because then people are like, okay, the role is new, but that idea has been here or, oh geez, the senior person said that they, from their standpoint, they see a real pain point or we had this incident, this thing happened. People don't know that. People don't know that's what triggered this. We had an audit, we're under a consent decree, crowd strike, whatever it is. Cool, I wanna be respectful of time. I'm happy to answer some more questions. So I'm gonna, all right. I okay, I can take one more question. If you got a burning one? Otherwise, oh yeah, right here. Hmm. Thank you. I, I'll just repeat briefly, although it, it's a compliment. I, that means a lot. Uh, person here is a consultant and said, I do this kind of stuff every six months, nine months, and it could be used not just in a new role, a new initiative, just asking those questions and coming to the organization are very fruitful. Um, I'm gonna grab a mask and then Kristen, I, I'll, I'll just step right outside over there. Happy to answer any questions. Quick plug at three o'clock today, I'm gonna be doing a workshop on how to read organizational culture from the outside in and I'd love for you to be there. Thank you so much.